All right. Hello. Oh. So uh, I just, uh, hi to everybody. I'm just going to talk for a few minutes to get this started. I see some people who were just in my class I've been doing for Word Bookstore. So hi again, guys. You just didn't get to see me, I guess, because reception was bad. Hopefully reception is better here. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to this special. Um, didn't get a chance to prepare anything in advance of Geek Speaks Greek. So um, just want to say welcome to everybody. Uh, I hope everyone's had a great weekend. I'm just going to kind of blather on a little bit because today <clears throat> I do have my drawing pad set up. I do have my special pen. It's just a marker. It's not special at all. But I'm just going to be today taking some questions, just doing some q and I keep We keep having this problem where every day where there's actually more good questions coming in than I can actually answer. So today... Since I didn't get a chance to really prepare for this because I was preparing a lesson for the um, the comics lessons I'm doing with uh, Word, today I'm just hoping that people ask me some good questions and then I could just kind of just talk. Just talk about whatever their questions are. I could draw some pictures maybe if it helps. So <clears throat> if you have any questions, yes, you have got to be tired. <laughs> I am tired, yeah. Also, um, if I could get a glass of water, that would be an amazing thing to have. So does anybody have any questions about Greek mythology or, oh, what or who is Hermaphrodite? Thank, I'm glad you asked. Hermaphrodite is the child of Hermes and Aphrodite. Now, you can tell by the name. The name is made up of the two, Hermes and Aphrodite together, right? But I was very careful not to use a gendered pronoun with Hermaphrodite because Hermaphrodite is both male and female. In fact, the scientific word for a person or an animal or any organisms, I guess, well, I guess an animal, that displays both male and female characteristics is hermaphrodite after this mythological being. Hermaphrodite was, in most myths, was born a boy, but took a bath in a special lake or a pond that made hermaphrodite take on the also the characteristics of a female. So, but... I like the idea hermaphrodite has just kind of been that way since the start. Hermes in particular often has very unusual children. We've talked about this in other things. I mean, this is a guy who one of his kids is half goat. So, <laughs> you know, it's like his kids, they come out, they're different. Than, they're, they're, they're a little bit plus. They're a little bit extra. So hermaphrodite uh, is a figure who was both um, a, a divine being who was both male and female. Saw some other questions go by. Will I be writing a Hestia book? Um, so the bad news is, it's a good news, bad news situation. The bad news is I will not be writing a book that's called Hestia, Goddess of the Hearth. The good news is, is that Hestia is going to be one of the main characters in the 12th and final Olympians book, which is going to be called Dionysus. We don't have a subtitle yet. But she is the narrator of it. She is the first Olympian, which I'm sure you knew. And she's the oldest of the Olympians as a result. And Dionysus is the last and the youngest of the Olympians. So Hermaphrodite, I, <laughs> I'm sorry, I just talking about it. So uh, Hestia, it's, the book is told from her point of view. It starts off where she's telling her view of the world, the creation of the world. Well, she misses the first part, but she sees the rise of the Olympians and the battle against the Titans and they're overthrowing and all that such, right? And then it's her seeing this young god coming who's different than the other gods. Because all the other gods, both their parents are gods. He's different. His mom is a mortal, a mortal. I always say that kind of unclear. So it's her seeing this new type of god, a god who's like a demigod who ascends to Olympus. So it's, I'm very excited about that one. Let's see. Which book of yours was easiest to create? Um... That's a great question because uh, some of my books are harder than others. I've maybe mentioned that writing Poseidon was the most difficult because I had a hard time getting into his mindset. Uh, also, my book Ares was really hard to draw because there were so many like armies in it. It just was like I had to draw a lot of people. The two easiest books were probably Zeus and Aphrodite. And the reason I say they were the easiest is because I had a very clear idea in working on these books. I'm like, oh, I think I know exactly what I'm going to write about them. So it came out very easily. Sometimes the thing that makes it the hardest is when you're working on a book, nobody ever writes something 
perfectly the first time. Nobody writes anything perfect for that matter, right? But when you're writing the book, it takes a lot of steps to just get to the point, you know, like where you're happy with it. And sometimes you get there quicker, but sometimes you have to spend a lot of time just kind of working it, working it, working it. And both Aphrodite and Zeus, I got to the stage I was happy with them much quicker than I normally would. Let's see what else we have here. Um, oh, another question about Hestia, but she's my favorite goddess. Somebody, yeah, I said that one already. I'm sorry she's your favorite that she doesn't get her own book, but she gets a lot of play in this one. So you get to read a lot about her. I see somebody says, the last book. Yes, Dionysus is going to be the last Olympians book. Because after I finish Dionysus, I'm going to be taking some time to do a four book series on the Norse gods. Thor, Loki, Odin, all those guys. It's going to be called Asgardians. I'm going to do that for a little bit. And then after I finish that, after I wrap that up, the plan is... If people are still interested in reading this, I want to come back and do some more books about Greek myths. The problem with Olympians, and there's no problem with Olympians. I'm very happy with the series. It's been my favorite thing in the world to do. But the series is called Olympians. So kind of all the stories I have to tell in there have to be about an Olympian or a god, you know, one of the main ones. But there's so many myths that we could think of that aren't about one of the Olympians. There's a lot of myths about minor goddesses and gods. There's a lot of stories about heroes, stories about monsters, stories about demigods. All these characters who aren't the big, we'll say 12, although we know there's more, Olympians. So because of that, I want to do a series. I don't know what it's going to be called yet. I played with the idea of Tales of the Olympians. It still has Olympians there. I want it to be tied in. I want to do maybe a book a year doing other Greek myths. But that's still a ways off, so we'll see about that. If you, if you have it, yeah. Is your series recommendable for somebody's seven-year-old son who really wants to read it? Oh, the question is from somebody. Would I recommend my series for someone's seven-year-old son because uh, he really wants to read it? Um, <clears throat> I go, uh, super real talk, I go out of my way to write these books to be as all ages friendly as possible. And there's some elements of Greek mythology which are, you know, I mean, there's cannibalism in almost every story, right? There's stuff that you just like, ugh. But I'm very careful to write about it in a way that it's age appropriate for the most part. I would say a lot of my fan base are seven year olds. Probably a lot of the people watching right now are seven years old. But it really kind of depends on the point of view of the family of the seven year old. If this seven year old is like pretty, if the parents are like very protective, or if the child is, you know, I don't think my books are particularly scary, but like, you know, there's monsters, there's stuff like that. There's, there's, a, there's uh, such adult terms as adultery. There's things like that that happen. If the parents are gonna be squeamish about that, I would say no. But as far as like introducing them to the concept of Greek mythology, you pretty much know what you're getting. I would be pretty confident saying a seven year old should be able to handle my books. Um, the question <clears throat> is, do I think that Aphrodite, Athena, and Hera would ever make up? This is clearly a reference to the famous judgment of Paris, which started the Trojan War, where basically, long story short, um, Zeus set the three goddesses apart against each other in a contest to see who was the most beautiful. Um, Aphrodite won, Hera and Athena did not. Now, Hera and Athena already made up. You can see, and even in my books, the Judgment of Paris occurs in the book Aphrodite. In Ares, you actually see Athena and Hera working together. And it's funny, because I don't really think they ever worked together before, but the two of them kind of coming together and having a common enemy, Aphrodite, they, they seem to enjoy each other. And it was really a fun thing to discover working on this series, because it's not just me making this up. You can find mythological precedent for this, that they kind of have an understanding after that. They even worked together in another story to overthrow Zeus, but that's a story for another day. But so as far as Aphrodite ever getting along with Athena, I feel like they're probably not mad at each other anymore, but those two would have nothing to say to each other. Like Athena's like, boy, did you hear about that new war in Asia Minor? And Aphrodite is like, you know, my hair looks really good today. And then they stare at each other awkwardly for a few minutes and they just walk away. They just don't have, they just don't have anything in common. All right, this is a great question, and I have to have my follow-up questions. If I could be any Greek god or goddess, who would I be? And I have my follow-up question is, do I have to do their job or just get their powers? 
Are they there to answer that immediately? No, but I mean, I'll give both answers then. You would have to be the, the god. I have to be the god, so I have to have their jobs. Because, okay, I would say, like, normally I'd be like, oh, I'm all about the Hermes, but I don't want to be Hermes. He's got so much jobs. He's working all the time. Like, like the dude has to be, like, the reason I want to be him is because he's so fast, right? And I like the idea of being fast and be able to do a lot of stuff. He's so fast because he has to literally be in millions of places at once. I don't want to be that fast. This isn't original. This isn't exciting. I'd probably be Zeus because then I could just chill out. I'm the boss of everything. I'm getting a big thumbs down from Super Assistant Nicole. But, like, I'm Zeus. I'm the boss. I'm like, you don't like that? Boom, blow you up with a lightning bolt. I'm just like, I just hang out on a cloud all day. I do whatever I want. I know it's not exciting. Oh, wait. Actually, that's a good point. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, let me change it. <laughs> she had a better idea. I'll be Hades. Yeah. yeah, I'll hang around. I have all the wealth in the world. I'm sitting there. I hang around underground all day. I get left alone when I want to. Everybody's eventually my guest. It's like, oh, I really want to meet that person. I guess I'll wait a few years until they're dead and they're down here. I get to meet everybody. I have, a, I have a dog that's got three heads. I have a wife that I actually love. She goes away from time, so I have some time just to myself if I want. Um, there's food down there, pomegranates at least. Yeah, Hades. I'll be Hades. Who do you think would win? All the Titans or Typhon? Oh, wow, wow. That's a great question. Who would win in a... I'm assuming a battle. That wasn't specified. Uh, all of the Titans at once. And I'm assuming we're talking multi-generation Titans. We're also going to include Oceanus in this number. who doesn't normally fight with the Titans. And the Titanesses, who also don't often fight with the gods, with the, with the Titans, against Typhon. That's super cool. I have to think about this for a second. I'm going to say... Oh, wait. I mean, here's the big question. The only reason Typhon was able to beat Zeus as soundly as he did is because he was armed with the sickle of Kronos the Titan. Who has the sickle in this instance? I feel like that could almost be the part that decides it. Because I feel like the Titans, they're enormous and vast and powerful. But so is Typhon. And the reason Zeus does so well against him in a fight is because Zeus is so agile. He's got, he's got crazy amount of power, but he's little. I feel like Typhon would actually defeat the Titans. I feel like the Titans, they're the gods of time, but they're also like these unmovable, powerful, stoic beings. And they don't have the, um, the ferocity that would need, be needed to defeat him. And I think he would just like, like Typhon would literally scour the earth that they stood on until there was nothing for the Titans to fall on. So yeah, I feel like Typhon would beat the Titans. But that's a great question. That's super cool. Do we have any more? Uh, yes. Um, would you ever make a book series about the heroes? Oh, so the question is, would I ever make a book series about the heroes? The idea for that series I was the, that I keep speculating, throwing out afterwards, like doing Olympians and after doing Asgardians, heroes would definitely be one of the things I want to do in there. Um, I'm actually going to use this as a break to draw a picture really quickly because one of the things I want to do in there, I really want to do, like I've mentioned before, Heracles is my favorite hero, right? There is a story, and there's one panel of this in one of my books, but I've already written this story for this series. Because sometimes I get so excited, I write stuff in advance. It's Heracles fighting the giant Antinous. Antinous, like all giants, giant means born from Earth, right? He is not, he's born literally from the Mother Earth. Like, he's huge, but that's kind of besides the point. So he was designed, actually, my good pal Dean Haspiel designed this guy. He was designed to look like a giant rock monster. And he fights Heracles. It's not one of Heracles' great um, um, labors. It's just, just a story. This is just like a Tuesday for Heracles. But this guy challenges Heracles, and Heracles, being incredibly strong, keeps grabbing Antinous and beating him up and throwing him on the ground. But every time he throws him on the ground, he touches the earth again. He's born from the earth. It's his mom. And Mother Earth, we see this in Athena, she could give her power to giants. So she supercharges them. So every time Heracles defeats this guy, he throws him down to the ground and he gets up again as good as ever. In fact, even stronger. So finally, the way Heracles defeats him, there's Heracles. There's his feet. I should give him a head, huh? Like, oh no, I'm being squished. Heracles picks him up in a bear hug and holds him up in the air and crushes him. 
above. He holds him up so he can't go down the ground. And one of the versions I found, there's a couple versions of the story, the one that's most interesting, he does it on the edge of a cliff. So then he kind of like, because like, you know, you crush him and you're holding him, then you put him in a gun, he gets better. And then he like throws him up in the air or maybe jumps with him off the cliff. And when he hits the ground, he's just shattered and he can't come back from that. So like, that's a story I really want to tell. So yeah, I will be doing the stories of the heroes for sure. And that's a little sneak preview of one of them. You could see one drawing of this in, a drawing very similar to this. I think it's in Hera. Um, the goddess in her glory. I show that picture very quickly. Right before Heracles dies, I show a little hint of some of his adventures. Uh, all of which are stories I would like to tell in a story of the heroes. Um, back to his guardians. Loki's not in his guardian, but he gets to sneak in for the series. <laughs> uh, that's actually a good point. Someone was mentioning in Asgardians, Loki's not actually an Asgardian. Does he get to sneak in just for this series? So, um, of course, in Norse mythology, Loki uh, is not. He's not one of the uh, the gods. So there's two types of gods. There's the Vanir and the Aesir. I, oh, man, that's getting into too much stuff. Loki is an Asgardian because he lives in Asgard. So if I called this theory the Aesir, then it would be a problem because he's actually a giant. He's not actually... He's not actually an Asir, which is the race of gods. But because I call it Asgardians, I'm going to say that's a little bit of a cheat. I'm able to sneak him in because it's where he lives. Now, that brings up the fact that I call Hades an Olympian and he doesn't live on Mount Olympus. That's a whole problem. But, you know, I can't be consistent all the time. Have you spent any time in Greece? Have I what? Spent any time in Greece. Uh, the question is, have I spent any time in Greece? Yes. Um, I spent about maybe six weeks going through Greece. Maybe a little bit more, I think it was. Um, when I first started working on Olympians, um, I actually moved overseas for a little bit. Uh, it was about eight months. I moved to um, Rome and because I, I love Rome. It's a nice place to live. It has the best food in the world. It's my favorite city. Come at me if you don't agree. But um, while I was in Rome, because it was so close to places, I would travel all around the Mediterranean and any place where they had worshipped. I basically made a wish list of all the places I wanted to see, where there was old temples or towns or ruins or museums. And I traveled all around the ancient, what would have been the ancient Greek and Roman world and studied them. And it was a really handy thing to do because... Um, one of the things I really strive to do with Olympians is to make the gods more than their stereotypes. What I mean is like so many times we read a book and it's like Hermes is the messenger of the gods. Hera's the Jew, uh, the, the, she's the jealous wife. And you're just like, okay, yeah, those things are true, but there's so much more to them. And going to these places and like seeing the spots where people used to worship the gods really made them a lot richer in my mind for me. In fact, this is a cool story really quickly. When I was in Athens, you go to the uh, Parthenon, right? And there's all there's a great museum there at the Parthenon. You can see all the statues that used to be there, some of them, because some of them got stolen by England, but that's another story. There were people, Greek citizens, who would volunteer their time to sit there and protect the statues. Not that they're worried you're going to break them. Just like if you would walk up with your camera and try to take a selfie, They'd be like, no, no, you can't do that. That's disrespectful to the gods. You were allowed to take photos of them. You were allowed to take photos of yourself, but you couldn't take a selfie of yourself in front of them because that was disrespectful. And seeing that, like so many centuries after most people really stopped believing these gods, but they were so important culturally to this day, that was something that really affected me. And I was really glad. I'm like, that's something I wouldn't have gotten if I didn't. I would never realize that if I hadn't gone there. So that was super cool. Would you work Eros and Psyche into the second Greek series? Uh, the question is, would I work Eros and Psyche into the second Greek series? Yeah, that's one of the plans. Um, one of the books would be a story of love stories, and it would be have like Orpheus and Eurydice, it would be Eros and Psyche, and maybe one other, like about maybe like three stories per book, I would think. Um, fun fact, Eros and Psyche was in an earlier draft of um, Aphrodite, and it got cut. Because she's only she's not important enough in the story, and it just it was too much to explain. So in the first draft, I was going to do that. Just like Orpheus and Eurydice was in the first draft of Hades, and that got cut as well. Sometimes you got to cut things and just be hopefully like later I'll get to do them somewhere else. How do you determine what your gods will look like in the books? Hmm. This is a cool one. 
a cool question because we were just I just literally taught a class like a moment ago about designing characters and the question was how do I decide what my gods will look like in the books first thing I do is um, <clears throat> I look for any written description of what the goddess or god looks like and uh, there's not as much as you'd think and my th thing I always say about that is because you know the gods could look like anything they want and the Greeks certainly knew that so they were often very hesitant to give a description of what the god looked like. I'm just gonna draw a picture of Zeus because he's an easy one to do, right? So Zeus, there's not a lot of information what he looks like. In fact, they don't really say anything. We, I think we have a certain idea in our head. He has to have a beard. He looks weird without a beard. And he has to be very good looking. We know he's good looking. So when I design Zeus, I first I get, I'll, I'll draw him with his curly hair. My Zeus, this won't be a color drawing, but if it was, Zeus has white hair. And if you look, just the hair independent of anything else, it kind of looks like a cloud, and that's on purpose. I gave him the white hair because A, we kind of expect it. He has to have the appearance of age without being old. He would never make himself look old because he wants to look super hot. But he has the white hair to give himself that little bit of borrowed dignity. But the white hair is also supposed to look like a cloud. He's the god of the sky, not just thunder, not just lightning the god of the whole sky. So, and then I would think of his personality, and Zeus is a little bit sly, a little devious even. So I give him a little bit of the eyebrows. He gives him maybe the side eye a lot. Again, if this was color, his eyes would be blue because he's the god of the sky. I gave him the exact same color blue I used to color the sky. And these are all thoughts. I, have like, I like to have little clues. Pretty much all the Olympians, because they are family, I decide to give them a familial nose. They all have a nose that's very similar. It's got a little bit of a crook. It's, you know, it's like, kind of like mine. I have the big bump, but like theirs is much smaller. He's got good cheekbones because he's good looking. He's almost always smiling because, like, like I was saying just a few moments ago, he's the boss of everything. He's got the best job in the world. I gave him a beard. Now, he looks pretty weird just Abe Lincoln in it like that. So then the final thing I gave him, and this is one of the clues, again, about his personality. I know his personality, what he's the god of. He has the little mustache, but it looks like a lightning bolt because he's the god of lightning. One of these days, I'll just do like a, maybe I'll do a lecture where I just go through every single one of my designs and break them down with all the little hidden clues like that because they all have little clues in the way they look. And if you watch some of my other episodes, which you can see on my uh, YouTube channel, they've all been archived, uh, George Olympians. When I draw them, I often talk about these things. And that's, I talk about some of the stuff I read that de determines their appearance. And if there's not a lot that determines their appearance that way, I talk about the little hidden, hidden visual cues like cloud hair or lightning bolt mustache to help me design it. And then I draw it a million times until it becomes easy and I can do it while I'm talking to other people. That's actually really important. To design a character, you gotta draw them a ton and you gotta draw them so much that they kind of become simple and become second nature. This is just a fun comment. Fun comment. I love all of your books so much. I went to the library and tried to check them all out and got in trouble. So I went home and, and bought them instead. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Super Assistant Nicole just passed. Super Assistant Nicole just passed on. I love all your books so much. I went to the library and tried to check them all out, but I got in trouble. So I went home and bought them instead. Why did you get in trouble? Were you taking them out too long, or did you create a ruckus there? Were you like, were you like trying to distract people? You like knocked over a bookshelf or something? And you're like, hey, 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 got these books. <laughs> Wait, what? Oh, well, thank you very much. That's. That's very kind. Uh, I love libraries. It breaks my heart. I haven't been able to go to the library for a while. Libraries, they, they, a lot of people find my books through libraries, but thank you so much for buying my books. That's awesome too. That's great. Why are there two gods of war? Why are there two gods of war? The same reason there, well, okay. <clears throat> there's a lot of gods that there's two of, like a lot of things. Like fire is an easy one, Hestia and Hephaestus. Childbirth, Artemis and Hera and Eletheia, who isn't even in my books. There's multiple overlaps. Healing, Asclepios and Apollo. It's because some things are so big that there's so many sides to them that maybe it's just there's different aspects. There's more than one god can handle, maybe. I don't know. So with um, the two gods of war in the Greek pantheon uh, are Ares and Athena. But if you really think about it, they're very different in the way they approach it. Um, Athena is the one of strategy and skill and training. She's all about like regimented and like thought and wisdom. That's her other aspect, right? 
And Ares, man, that guy's not wise. He's like kind of a uh, he's he's losing it. Like he's his name literally meant to be like going crazy on the battlefield. It's not fun, but it's probably happened to all of us. There's probably been a time in your life when you've gotten so angry or so upset about something that you're just like, ah! That was Aries. That's like, they would, that was actually used as a verb that you would like Aries on someone. So he was like, Athena's all like, the best way to deal with this war is to bring our troops over here and defend this position. At the same time, we maybe send another troop over just to scout out the enemy's force. Ares like, send me in the direction to chop stuff up. And that's the difference. They're very different things. They're both aspects of war. They're both things that you see in war. But he's like the chaos and she's the control. And so they both work together for war. Which female goddess would you be? Ooh, which female goddess would I be? Uh, again, assuming I have to have their powers. I mean, their duties. I wouldn't, I, although Hera is my favorite, I wouldn't want to be here because Zeus is a creep and he's a bad husband. Sorry, Zeus. Um, <clears throat> Artemis jumps to mind because she runs around the woods all day. That's kind of cool. And she's really her own boss. She doesn't have a lot of duties. And she's also the protector of women and children, which is pretty cool. And animals. Yeah, Artemis. I'd be Artemis. I already made up my mind. I'd shoot all the poachers. <laughs> Will you do anything else with Hecate in your next Greek series? Will I do anything else with Hecate in my next Greek series? All right, well, good news. Hecate makes a brief appearance in Dionysus. It's brief, but she's there, so you get that. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Hecate comes up, though, off the top of my head. I don't. I can't think of any myth that like is jumping to mind where she plays a major part. She's an interesting character, like many of them. And that she's much more strongly referenced in, um, in like, cult, like the actual religion, than she is the stories. I think part of that is because, well, we were talking about gods who take, like, how there's two gods for a role. She fills a lot of the same roles as Hermes, and he just kind of takes it all for himself. So she's like, she's like a goddess of boundaries and crossroads and magic. And so is he, and he's much more well-known. So he's kind of absorbed a lot of this stuff. So I think story-wise, she doesn't get as much of a chance to shine. But she is a personal favorite of mine. Um, she has the tripartite version where she's got like the three aspects. And I had a lot of fun whenever I drew her that I would draw her like in three different moods and three per panels in a row. So I'll probably find something to do with her, but I can't think of it. If you could think of something offhand that you're like, oh, you should definitely do that. You should email to me at, uh, George O'Connor books at gmail.com. I'd love to see it. Couldn't remember my own email for a second. Do you think all the Titans are depressed? <laughs> this is a question we've definitely gotten before. I don't think we ever got to answer it, but I'm glad I finally do. Do I think the Titans are depressed? Depressed. Um, so backstory for those of you who don't know, the Titans were the first gods, the first race of gods. They're overthrown by the Olympians. The vast majority of them are imprisoned in Tartarus, which is so far beneath the surface of the earth that if you drop an anvil from the surface of the earth, it takes 24 hours to get to Tartarus. So they're not seeing any sun. Those guys, yeah, they're all depressed. They're stuck in cages down there with bars of adamantine. Uh, they're being guarded by the Hecatonchires. They like the darkness because they're weird. But like, I, I think the Titans are bummed. They're like, we were in charge of everything, and now we're just in this smelly hole. And you know what? Creus, he's not using deodorant. That guy really smells. He's one of the Titans. And then if the, some of the Titans who weren't, like Atlas. We talked about Atlas the other day when I talked about Prometheus. You can see that episode on George Olympians. Prometheus, I mean, Atlas, his job is to hold up the entire sky. He has to hold the atmosphere. It weighs billions of tons, and he can't let it up for a second. So he's stuck there like this for, like, ever. So he's probably pretty depressed, too. Although the question did come up, who's ha I'd rather be him because at least I get to see the sun and his daughters get to visit him and stuff. Man, the guys down in the underworld, they're just... But I do have a happy story. There are certain versions of the myths where uh, eventually Zeus releases the Titans. I even make a reference to it in the first book, Zeus. I mentioned that Kronos rules from the Islands of the Blessed. The Islands of the Blessed were these islands. They don't really have a geological place, like a point, a geographical place I could really point to. It was like a mythological area that Zeus eventually frees the Titans so that they can go there. And Kronos is the leader of the Islands of the Blessed. So... It's actually a late antiquity story. They were eventually like Zeus forgives his dad. 
Um, it's not going to be an Olympians because there's not really much to that story. But yeah, eventually the Titans got out. And they're all hanging out on an island somewhere. Like, well, this is certainly better than the alternative. Uh, someone asked, can you make a book on Nyx, please? Um, I got a request for um, doing a book on Nyx, the goddess of night. And she would be a good candidate to maybe do like one myth about because she doesn't really have very she's one of those characters she's a primordial goddess she's uh interesting she is the mother of um uh eris so she's got this kind of like side thing that where she's like this alternate like family tree that doesn't really tie in with the olympians on which is like something like because almost everyone does but she doesn't really feature into too many myths so I don't think she would get a whole book unless I engage in some like uh, – I'd have to engage in some rampant speculation and just make up some stuff. And who knows? Maybe I will in the future. Um, if you know of a story about Nyx that you think would be a really good story, again, write to me, George O'Connor Books at Gmail because I would love to read that myth because right now, off the top of my head, I'm not thinking of one that would be like perfect for a book. What do you think Mother Earth and the sky actually look like and where do you think Gaia lives? Oh, so the question is, what do I think Mother Earth and the sky, actually, or Uranos, actually look like, and where do I think Mother Earth lives, Gaia? So <clears throat> the Greek versions of these, the, the, in the Greek idea, Mother Earth is a goddess. So I think Mother Earth, Gaia, I think she looks like the planet. I think she is, I think Gaia is the planet. And at the same time, I feel like Uranos, the sky, is the same thing. He's like the sky. Weirdly, though, it does occur to me, we don't normally see him personified as the daytime sky. And I think that's because, so he's before the other gods and goddesses, right? He's like the, like, first there's this Gaia. Then she creates Uranos. Then together they have children like Titans, the Cyclopes, the Hecatonchires. There's no sun yet. The sun is Helios. Helios is the next generation after that. So I think Uranos is like the night sky, like specifically like outer space. And the Greek idea of um, the night sky, they didn't really, I mean, they had theories, some did, but like when these myths came about, they didn't know that that was stars. They didn't know it was millions of suns. They thought he was like this black inky figure who was remote and distant because he fled, but he was just set with jewels that sparkled or whatever they were, little balls of fire, whatever it was. So I think he's that. I think he's just... He's the night sky, and I think Gaia is the earth. I think you want to go say hi to it. You want to go meet a goddess. Go outside as long as you're being responsible and socially distancing yourself. Go outside and just touch the ground. And that's Gaia. That's where she is. Since Dionysus and Hestia have both been in the 12th chair of the gods, which one would you rather have occupy the 12th chair? Oh, that's a great question. So, uh, and that's part of what, that's a big part of what my book um, Dionysus is about. At different times of mythological history, both Hestia and Dionysus have inhabited the so-called 12th seat of the Olympians. You could argue there's more than 12 Olympians, but 12 is a big number that's always been attached to them. And when you have the 12 gods, they kind of switch off. And it's normally, um, it's normally understood she held the seat first, and then she surrenders it to Dionysus. But I want to make it super clear, especially because I know there's some Hestia fans here. She doesn't surrender it because she feels threatened or she feels lesser than Dionysus. For Hestia, being the oldest god has given her wisdom beyond the other gods, the other Olympians, I should say. And thrones are not important to her. And it's like, if you look at the way she was worshipped, she doesn't have a lot of temples. For her, it just was like, hey, you have your house, you have your fireplace, that's enough for me. Just throw a little thing in there for me once in a while. Just say a prayer to me. I'm good. She's very humble. She's not about a throne. She's not about setting herself above humanity. She literally would live in everyone's house in their fireplace. So for her, I think the throne was something she always felt very uncomfortable about. Like if you have a job where you have to wear like a tie every day, you might look very good in the tie. And it might be a reason you wear the tie, but you, at the end of the day, you don't want to have a tie. I think that's how she was with the throne. For Dionysus who had a lot to overcome as a young guy. He's the only god who's got a mortal parent. There's a lot of people out to kill him, including some of the other gods. Taking the throne gave him a layer of protection that he needed. It gave him a, it gave him a place on Olympus, and he needed that to survive. So I'm happier that he has the throne, because I think it worked out better for both of them. Hestia, 
She made her own spot. You can see in my posters of the gods and stuff and the images. She just kind of has her own spot in the middle, and that's where she wants to be. Everyone sits around her telling stories. Perfect. That's what the way she wants it. And Dionysus, he gets his throne, and he has that. He's it's it makes him valid in a way that he was he didn't feel he was otherwise. Do we know who the father of Eros is? Hmm. The question is, do we know who the father of Eros, a.k.a. Cupid, is? And um, <clears throat> in Olympians in particular, I play around with that because there is different myths that claim different things. It's always important to remember in Greek mythology, there wasn't like the equivalent of the Bible. There wasn't one codex of stories where they're like, this is the way it is and anything that doesn't agree with this is wrong. The er mythology, Greek mythology existed for thousands of years. A lot of it was told orally. When it would get written down, it would be reflecting a certain oral tradition of a certain area. They didn't have printing presses. They didn't text. They didn't have all this stuff. They had stories that they would tell for thousands of years sometimes. So different versions of stories would came about. But what makes so much fun with Eros is that it really plays into the character of Eros and Aphrodite. Aphrodite has too much love to just be with just like she has many lovers, right? So there are myths when Eros is the son of her union with Ares, which makes sense to me because Eros causes a lot of strife. And in fact, his myths, a lot of his myths, you see Eros causes trouble. Aphrodite doesn't do that as much. She tends to bring people together in a happier way. Eros tends to do like little hee hee prank and like, let me love the donkey or something. So the war thing makes some sense. But at the same time, he also, there are some myths where Hermes is his dad. And that also makes a lot of sense because he does create a lot of trouble. And Hermes is the trickster. And he's kind of like, you look at the stories of Hermes as a baby, he's a lot like Eros. He causes trouble. And also, there's the whole winged thing, right? Hermes doesn't have wings, but he's got wings on his feet and on his head. And Eros has wings. And that's also interesting. There's even the versions that say Hephaestus is his dad, which makes sense. His parents were married at the time. We know that she wasn't always faithful to Hephaestus. But that also makes sense to me because Hephaestus is very crafty. And there's like the certain craftiness to Eros. And also, I just kind of like they did like the kid would be a rebel because the parents didn't match together well. So Eros is always this kid who's always acting out. We've seen that happen. Sometimes when parents aren't a good couple, the kid kind of comes up kind of rotten. And finally, there's the version where Eros doesn't have a dad. Where basically... When Aphrodite is the self-made goddess, she created herself from the severed portion of Uranus, that when she created herself, she already had this baby inside of her. And so she gives birth to Eros herself. And I could almost see Aphrodite doing that and just kind of letting all these other gods and goddesses, well, not goddesses, these other gods think that he's there, the dad, because why not? It makes some sense. So... I know what my personal feeling. I don't know if I'm going to share it. I have my theory who it is, but I, they all make sense to me. Where do you think Persephone is during this quarantine? Would she be in the underworld or with her mother above? Ooh, where do I think Persephone is during this quarantine? Is she in the underworld or with her mother above? Well, that is an interesting question. Because it is springtime. If we were to look out my window right now, there's just trees covered with beautiful blossoms and there's little bees flying around and I can't go outside for any of it. Uh, but there is kind of the mythological precedent. So that's when she should could be coming back. But I challenge any of my listeners here today, or viewers, I guess you are, to tell me a story where she's again on Olympus after the time she's supposed to go down there. I feel like even if you can't find that, it makes a lot of sense, given that you have to stay where you are and you can't travel right now, that she's still in the underworld. Because I feel like this is the spring that isn't really happening. We all get to experience it in little ways, but we're kind of trapped behind windows. We have to be away from people. Normally in New York at this time of year, the streets would be teeming full of people and everybody would be partying. And like, because it's New York and we're used to cold weather, we'd all be like wearing like tank tops and shorts and stuff, even though it's like not that warm yet. It's not happening this year. And I feel like she's still in the underworld. What does it mean when Zeus has stars in his eyes? <laughs> so uh, the question is, what does it mean when Zeus has stars in his eyes? And this is actually, uh, this is kind of a metaphor that I had created for this series. This is my own spin on things. As a, um, as a storyteller, you have to come up with your own spin on things. We talked a lot about Uranus and my theory that Uranus 
his real appearance is he looks like the inky blackness of outer space, just stars and blackness. He doesn't have a human form, really. He's the first god. He has a son, Kronos. And when I drew Kronos, Kronos, oh no, my pen's dying. Kronos overthrows Uranos. When he overthrows him, he cuts a part of him off. That part becomes, oh, a new pen, thank you. That part becomes Aphrodite. So it all ties in. These are good questions today. It's really creating a narrative. Um, when I drew Uranos, when he cut open his dad, he bled his powers out. And the powers became part of, of Kronos. And so after that point, if you look, I don't show Kronos much beforehand, but before he overthrows his dad, he just has green eyes like the rest of the Titans do. And then he takes the power from his, from his dad and he becomes the new Lord of the universe and his eyes become like stars and his mouth, which I won't draw as big as I normally do because I don't want to draw that many stars. His mouth becomes a void of stars because he has this power of his father in him. But it also, Uranus was a terrible dad. Kronos was a terrible dad. They're both really power hungry. And I use the stars to show that they're power hungry. Now, when I draw Zeus, that's just his face. I should finish it up real quick, right? Heads, clouds, doo doo doo. When I draw Zeus, not always, but especially when Zeus is behaving poorly in a megalomaniacal sort of power hungry way, I will draw him where just this part of the color of his eyes, instead of being the blue of sky, it's the dark of night with the stars in it. And that's to show that he has a lot of the same traits as his father and his father before him for the power hungry. I'm so glad you brought this up because this is actually a major point in the final Olympians book. And you're going to see a resolution to this whole idea of gods with too much of their father in them. What other books would you write if you didn't write about Greek gods? Well, what other books would I write if I didn't write about Greek gods? I'm always working a lot of projects and I somehow never have enough time to do them all. Um... <clears throat> I really want to, uh, I'm going to do the Asgardians, that's Norse gods. I really want to do a story, there's a story I've been working on for years now, off and on, about a little girl that lives in a monster's ear. I'm working on that story. Uh, what are some of the other ones I'm working on? Oh, I'm working on a whole like series that you'll hopefully be seeing soon about like kind of a scary haunted town. That's something. I, I, I like to do stories based on things I'm interested in. And I like to read about spooky stuff. I like to read about monsters. Like pretty much any book you've ever seen me do, it's a book of something that I have an interest in. Um, I want to do a book about my cats. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm doing a book about my cats and it's, it's very appropriate right now because it was a book about how my cats would deal with the apocalypse. And we're not in the end times, but it certainly feels like that sometimes. <clears throat> Wait, which one? Oh, and then I also, yeah, I do other books. I do... Um, Right here, like I do books like these. You know, a lot of my Olympians, I like. I do this whole series. There's the Super Turbo books. Super Turbo is a spinoff of Captain Awesome. I've done like twenty something Captain Awesome books about a little boy who pretends to be a superhero. This is about a hamster who pretends to be a superhero. I like superheroes, so I do a lot of different stuff. Um, that's a cool thing about my job. It's I basically get to like find the things that I'm a geek for, and then I just do books about them. It's pretty cool. Which god would win? Hades, Zeus, or Poseidon? Oh, no. The question is, of the three brothers of the original OG Olympians, who would win in a battle, Zeus, Poseidon, or Hades? Now, <clears throat> picture this. Three-way battle. They're all faced off in three corners. Zeus, connection. All right, we're back. Zeus crackling with electricity. Poseidon brandishing his... Um, his trident that causes earthquakes, both gifts of the, of the Cyclopes, right? Hades, the oldest brother, probably the smartest brother, also the calmest brother. He looks at the two brothers bristling with their hatred for each other because those two have real issues. He gets along, especially with Zeus. We don't really know his relationship with Poseidon as much, but I don't think they have any problems. And he just puts on his helmet of invisibility that makes him invisible even to other gods. So the other two just hammer each other for however long it takes. And they're both immortal gods who really don't get tired or can't really hurt each other. So this battle could last forever. But eventually I figure something's going to happen where one of them would get a win over the other one somehow. But the other one would be in rough shape. And then Hades just takes off his helmet, 
walks over and bops him on the back of the head or something. I think Hades wins. You said Hera doesn't like Dionysus, but does Dionysus hate Hera? Huh. Oh, that's a good question. So in a previous episode, I guess, because I don't remember saying it today, I mentioned that Hera doesn't like Dionysus. And the reason she doesn't like Dionysus is because Dionysus is one of many, one of the many of Zeus's children by another woman. Um, but does Hera hate Dionysus? Because, um, you know, I don't think he does. I don't think he, I think he knows that she doesn't like him. And I think he kind of enjoys needling her a little bit just by his presence. But the thing about Dionysus, especially the way I write Dionysus, is um, he is the god of madness, right? That's one of his things. He's actually a little bit crazy. And he's kind of a fun crazy. Like, it, it, it maybe sometimes he doesn't take, um, he doesn't understand, um, like, the consequences of things that much. So even though Hera's done some st things to his life that have made it difficult, and there's also some question whether or not Hera does it, or if it's something that he himself, by virtue of his own abilities of generating madness around him, did it himself, which is a cool thing to play around with in the story too. I think he's just kind of like, all right, I understand you. You're an enemy. I maybe have to keep you at a certain distance, like arm's length, but we're all part of a family now. Hey, let's all chill out. Plus, if it came down to like naked power, she's way more powerful than him, so it's probably not a good idea just to like mess with her that way. So yeah, I don't think he hates her. I think he just is like, but again, it's probably like that earlier question about Athena and um, Aphrodite, like don't know how much they would have to talk about. I bet you they would have fun gossiping to each other, honestly. Someone said, I thought Lena was mortal. Uh, okay, did they ask Lee Duh or Lee Toe? Lee okay, here's the thing. Somebody asked if they thought Lee Toe was mortal. She's not, but she's very similar to another love of Zeus named Lee Duh. And my theory is at one point they probably were the same being. There's certain times in Greek mythology you see characters who seem to have gone a split where they were maybe one character and one of them is divine and one is mortal. With Heracles, you see that literally. But if you take a look at a character like Perseus, I'm pretty sure Perseus is just a story of Hermes as a mortal. He's got the wings, he's got like the helmet, he's kind of like, it's just like the story ties in, like they're almost interchangeable in artwork sometimes. And I think, I think something happened the same with Leto and Leda, where they were the same character. Because Zeus is with both of them, he has twins with both of them. Just with Leda, his twins are either the Dioscurity or Helen and Clytemnestra, or both of them. And with Leto, the twins are Apollo and Artemis. So I think that's very, very similar names and twins. I think at one point there was a goddess named Leto or Leta who had twin with it, but two of those gods ascended to true godhood, Apollo and Artemis, and the other two kind of hung around in demigod status sort of thing. So, yeah, does that answer it? I hope that answers it. That's some of my pet theories, but... What is... Who is your favorite Greek mythological monster? My favorite Greek mythological monster, uh, growing up, was always the Minotaur, but nowadays it's definitely Typhon. Um, when we talked about Typhon, hundred heads, huge. I, I feel like I go through this description almost every episode. Each head speaks a different language. They all vomit poison and breathe fire. His body so big it fills the sky. His wings scrape the stars. And he's a thunder god, just like Zeus. It's like, well, a thunder monster. Yeah, so he's awesome. If you could choose one of the Greek gods or goddesses to be your sibling, who would you choose? Oh, no. What a great question. If I could choose one of the goddess, gods or goddesses to be my sibling, who would I choose? I can look at my poster I have over here. Like, who's really good to their sibling? Oh, Athena. I've actually heard descriptions of Athena as the best big sister. She's like the idealized big sister. Like she would be such a good big sister to have because she would look out for you and she'd give you advice. And she wouldn't be like, you know, some of the gods are really competitive. She doesn't really seem like, I mean, she's competitive with Poseidon for like cities, but I'm just me. I'm like, I don't need there to be any Georgiaville. That'd be a terrible place to live. I'm like, you, you, you go have Athens. You go do your thing. I'd just be happier looking out for me. Yeah, Athena for sure. Last question, good, because we're almost done. Do any of the Greek gods have helmet hair when they take off their helmets? What a great question. I, and I'm being serious. Do any of the gods have helmet hair when they take off their helmets? 
I'm going to say no. And my theory about this is because they're shape changers, right? Like the, everything about their appearance, like the reason they have hair that we perceive, the reason why Zeus has white cloud hair is because he chooses to have white cloud hair. Zeus could choose to have a six foot tall purple mohawk if he wanted, right? He could do whatever he wanted. So Ares wearing that helmet all the time because it makes them look scary. Athena wears the helmet all the time because it just makes her look weird without it. They take it off, their hair is as luxurious and beautiful and curly or whatever they want. And it's always gonna smell like Jasper, whatever, because they're gods and they're shape changers. They don't sweat. They don't get matted down. Their hair is just like, they don't They don't even understand why that would happen because they're not like us. They're not evolved from monkeys. They, 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 they just, they're made, they made an imitation, their, their physical form. So like, they don't get, they wouldn't even know to make their hair smush down. Cause they're like, oh, that's a thing that happens. Man, that stinks. Too bad to be you guys. Well, I'm going to go hang out on Mount Olympus and drink nectar and ambrosia all day. So everybody's saying thank you for answering our questions. <laughs> th- uh, people are saying thank you for answering questions. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, I know this was kind of a last minute thing. Uh, stuff's a little bit cuckoo this week because I am teaching this week long, well, this three day long course, course at Word. Uh, first one was done today. We had a little bit of a learning curve, but I think it ended up being fun. A lot of people follow me here. Hi, guys. Um, so I think we're going to be doing kind of like Geek Speak Lights on tomorrow. And then on Wednesday, I'm actually going to be on Word's, um, uh, it's a three, right? Isn't that competing? Four. At four o'clock, instead of here, I'm going to be in words thing. I'm going to be with my good friend, Ian Lendler. Where's his book? It's backwards, I know. Ian did this amazing book called The First Dinosaur. And it's about, not the first dinosaur, it's about the first dinosaur discovered by people. And when they started figuring out dinosaurs are. It's an amazing history book. He's going to be talking about that. I'm going to be live drawing with them. We'll be posting stuff about this this week. So no Geek Speak on Wednesday. Instead, you get to see me talk about my other great passion, dinosaurs. Then Tuesday, we're, tomorrow, we're just going to do something light. And then Thursday and Friday, I'll do a proper Geek Speak. I already have some ideas for who I'm going to talk. But if you have any theories about who you'd want to see or requests, write to me again at georgeoconnorbooks at gmail. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>